after seeing those things, I should have gone to a chapel. I should have prayed a rosary. I should have even prayed. I never prayed back then. It, it, it's something that, like, if you had to ask me, like, you regret anything. Yeah, it was probably that time in my life. Welcome back to another episode of Miked Up. I'm David Gordon, your host, and I'm here today with Mike Lerner, the host of the New Nation podcast and a former photographer for both Katy Perry and Justin Bieber. Mike Lerner is a revert to the Catholic faith, and today we're going to be discussing his reversion story and kind of just his journey back into the heart of the church. How are you doing, Mike? I'm well, David. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Glad Thanks for Thanks for coming on. It's great to have you. Um, first of all, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your Catholic upbringing? Um, it, you know, how you started off in the church, uh, really when you were baptized, uh, childhood sure. faith and whatnot. Okay, sure. I don't, and I don't know if this story is in any way heretical, if I've done any heresy, but when I, my, so my dad is Jewish, but non-practicing. Jewish in name only, really. Uh, and my mother's uh, from Latin America. She's from El Salvador. So she was obviously born and raised Catholic into the faith. And when she moved to this country in the late 70s, her and my father married in the early 80s. She didn't really, I don't want to say that she didn't acclimate herself uh, into any of the churches that were here. But I think it was when we were a little bit younger, before the second grade, she met a group of friends. And this group of friends, I think, were Lutheran. And so I she started taking us to a Lutheran church that was close by, and I was actually baptized Lutheran. It wasn't until after the third grade that we started attending a Catholic grammar school that we then started, my brothers and I, we started to um, um, get heavily involved in, I, I don't know if you would call it RCIA for kids or what the kids go through, but that's when we, um, that's when I received the Eucharist, went through confirmation. So um, it wasn't until I was around eight or nine years old that I started, uh, I guess, my real journey into becoming a Catholic, if that makes sense. I don't know. Was that allowed? Was I allowed to do that? Um, allowed in what sense? I mean, obviously, I don't have to be rebaptized, correct? Right. That's right. If they're doubtful about the validity of your first baptism, um, they might conditionally baptize you. That, that, mm -hmm. that all falls on the, the priest, and they're well-trained, well-schooled, theoretically, in, right. in when to do such things. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, after the Eucharist, my brothers and I, we became altar servers, uh, and then I went to a Catholic high school and eventually a Catholic university. Sure. Okay. Where did you go to uh, university? St. John's University in Jamaica, Queens. They are a, oh, I forget the, I forget the order. I can't remember. Well, tell me a little bit about high school. How was your high school experience as a Catholic? Uh, you know, it's something we share. I went to a nominally Catholic high school that mm -hmm. really did nothing to help my faith and a lot Same. to actually hinder my faith. So um, I don't know if that was your experience. Was your was your high school very faithful? Was it um, or was it more lax in its Catholicism, trying to just be like prep school to get people into secular universities so they can uh, become a big shot? No, I think, I mean, I think our high school was pretty conservative and not lax or not really uh, secular. There, there is Kellenberg Memorial High School. They were founded by uh, Marianists and took its name after Bishop Kellenberg, uh, who I believe was the bishop of the archdiocese on either Long Island or New York. Um, but they were, I, I remember there's someone in my homeroom now who is a priest. Uh, so he took his faith very seriously and still does. Uh, his name's Matthew McDonald. I don't know if you've ever had him on the show before. Uh, I've just seen him doing a lot of podcasts recently. But I think that if I would have, if I would have maybe paid attention more, if I would have been a little bit more willing to take it seriously, I think it would have been a great place to to be. I think it would have been a a, a great place to practice, and I think it, I would have benefited from that uh, now more than anything. So I think I didn't take it seriously because. You know, like, sure, you know, uh, being a young man in high school, you get distracted by a lot of things. And even though you're at a Catholic high school, you, you tend to kind of push it off to the side and not take it very seriously. Absolutely. It was your school co-educational? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, our, I, our I, brother's school. So we were the sister school to a school called Chaminade, which was an all boys school. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times when you have that co-education environment, high school becomes more about dating and about being showy and peacocking mm -hmm. than it does about the actual um, substance of education. And we have Pope Pius XI that warns about the dangers of co-education in his encyclical uh, Divini Ilius Magistri, uh, where he really covers Catholic education head to toe. Um, and he's, he's not shy. Uh, he doesn't mince words about really condemning co-education because it does introduce just a whole host of issues into the educational environment. Okay, so give me, tell me about, you know, kind of faith journey in high school. What was that like? Was it upward trajectory, uh, largely downward trajectory? Was there some singular event that kind of caused you to drop off? Um, how was that? No, I mean, I, 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 it wasn't upward or downward. I think that line just stayed, you know, pretty even. There was nothing that was, that was pulling me. There was nothing that was necessarily pushing me away. It still would go to church. We would still have uh, assemblies and have speakers. That would be very interesting. But I, I don't think anything really inspired me. And nothing was really shoved down our throats. Like, like we did in high school, we would have to take a relig uh, religion class every, every year. And I believe at even university level, we had to take at least uh, three or two or I can't remember the either the number of electives or the number of classes. But for a freshman year in uh, university, we had to take at least one religious focused class. So nothing was shoved down our throats that would necessarily push me off. Like, I guess a lot of people have that story where they're just kind of, um, you know, pushed and pushed upon. Uh, a certain faith and they just you know sooner or later they kind of pull away from it but that ne didn't necessarily happen to me i don't know what it was i just like i said before i didn't really take it seriously so then when did it when did you have the actual drop off of practicing the catholic faith was there you know like i would say i would say it definitely came during college um, okay I, I didn't go away to school i still commuted to school but it was something that I, I don't know as, as a family we just necessarily didn't do anymore there was no reason for me to be at church since i was too old to be an altar server so the obligation wasn't there um and and, and you know i don't want to make it sound like i am kind of blaming my family or insulting my family by them not taking me but at this point I'm an adult and I wasn't forced to do anything, but my mother's still uh, very religious, uh, very devout Catholic. So uh, it's definitely, you know, not putting any blame on her. It's just something that I don't, I don't know. It's just thinking about it now on the spot, I can't really, you know, pinpoint any particular reason. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, especially this is my experience, you just go off to a university, you get caught up kind of in the spirit of the world and in your day-to-day -day concerns. And it's really easy for people, unless they are just very grounded in their faith and well catechized, mm -hmm. uh, it's really easy to get caught up in the current of life and just drift away, especially, I mean, I'm not sure if this was the case for you, but the, the prevailing winds at many colleges Colleges are highly, highly secular. Um, now, obviously, you went to a Catholic college. Uh, I'm not sure if you felt that at all, but as you know, especially you know, stateside, at a lot of Catholic colleges and universities, might as well just be you know at the local state U. The, there's no culture uh, or atmosphere of Catholicism. And I mean, who knows if there even was, because the, like I said, I commu I still commuted to school. I lived uh, at home all throughout university because it was only about a 30, 30 minute drive. I never stayed on campus for anything extracurricular, whether it really be sports or any type of events or any type of religious ceremonies or events. So I just didn't know. I didn't take it upon myself to be active in that. So that was probably just the drop off in high school. It wasn't it was mostly the world. Like you said, it was mostly the outside world and you know being a 20 year old 21 year old and being able to do certain things legally that probably distracted me very heavily sure sure so that kind of tepidity uh just is able to set in and take hold that lukewarmness in a sense in the practice of the faith yes uh, so then what what happened next like did you did you graduate college i know you're into mm -hmm. photography and you've done yeah. that professionally did you get a degree in the fine arts or where did you take your career then 
I got a degree in history uh, with the uh, focus on the Second World War. And what I wanted to do initially, I wanted to be a historical researcher for film. So let's say, you know, Steven Spielberg's making Saving Private Ryan. I'm sure that there's a, a team that makes sure that everything is historically accurate or there's someone working at the studio that provides reference materials, which those jobs did exist to a certain extent, not so much anymore with, you know, the advent of the Internet. Um, so I had really no idea what I was going to do. I started working for a law firm as a courier. So I said, OK, maybe law is, a, you know, a, a field that I could uh, find some interest in. So I took the LSATs. After I took the LSATs, I never applied to any law school because I started playing uh, poker for some <laughs> sort of a living, both online and in person, which I did OK in. And then photography was just this kind of side hobby that I had always done since I was little. My father, you know, always had film cameras around that he taught me and my brothers how to use. And then one day it just clicked where I was at an event and I was shooting a musician and it just kind of snowballed from there where I was able to contact uh, people's management that I wanted to photograph. And eventually that led to Katy Perry and the photos that I took of Katy throughout, you know, the course of a year or two landed me bigger people like Justin Bieber. And that's how I was able to get the Justin Bieber position through uh, that work with uh, smaller bands and musicians. Okay, so you were on with Justin Bieber uh, as a contracted member of his team, were you not? Right, right. I was his tour photographer, correct. How long did that last? So that went from early 2011 to late 2014. Um, and then it was just one of those things where I said, okay, guys, what's the next assignment? And they said, Hey, we're moving in a different direction. Um, and I think looking back on it at the time, I probably was a little bit of trouble to work with. Uh, but who knows? That's just Hollywood. They kind of, they kind of drop you for whatever reason. You just kind of have to accept it. Sure. Yeah. Ultimately, you know, it's, there are just different divisions, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, they want really minute uh finicky things at times uh it could be a strategy decision yeah um okay so how was your faith when you were on board with the beebs were you at that point contemplating a return to catholicism i mean obviously as is well known um you know the music industry is not known for scrupulosity in faith and morals i imagine that that environment was was it at odds with the catholic faith um was was there any kind of christian presence on on scene there at the beginning no and that that will test every person as far as morality and as far as faith just because i mean it it is how you see it portrayed in movies and on television. It's just, it's debauchery and it can be, uh, especially, you know, with, with the crews that you travel with, because, you know, I've seen a lot of married men do things that married men should not be doing. And I always saw that. And I said to myself, I can never do that. And luckily I never did, but I wasn't, I wasn't acting in a way that was moral or virtuous myself either. So I can't be a hypocrite and say, hey, you shouldn't be cheating on your wife over here while as a young single guy, I'm, let's say, taking advantage of the, uh, the you know, the word, the, the world of the flesh that was kind of like offered up to me on a silver platter. So I don't, I don't, I don't really, I don't really have good memories of that. The memories that I had that I did like while being on tour was being able to travel and meet a lot of really really cool people who i still have friendships with and as far as there being a christian presence it, it's well known that justin uh is a a christian and i don't know how you want to apply that he he's kind of like part of this non-denominational world of like hillsong and all those types of churches and every now and then toward the end of my career with him there's a pastor named judah smith who was heavily present with him at times. I believe he was with us for most of Australia, a lot of the United States. And I had even asked uh, this pastor to marry my myself and my then fiance at the time. This is now an ex-fiance. Um, and looking back on that now, I said, wow, I didn't even, I didn't even really challenge myself. I never really looked into it. I just saw this pastor as a sort of uh, spiritual presence around this tour. Maybe I can learn something from him. And even then I didn't really even gravitate to him because I still felt a little bit of my Catholic upbringing where this doesn't necessarily seem genuine because you have a preacher who is present during 
a lot of, let's say, you know, immoral and irreligious activity going on. So I don't know how seriously I could, I could take him, which luckily that relationship ended. So I was never married by a pastor. Thankfully. So you're saying he himself kind of condoned the, what you saw on tour and some of the debauchery there, or he just turned a blind eye to it? And I, get, I guess maybe a blind eye. I don't want to put a lot of blame on him. I'm just saying that if you have someone who is a representative of the faith, I don't know if I would, I don't know if I could be present on a tour, if that makes any sense. If you want to, and I believe he had either, uh, scripture readings or the bible study with justin privately and publicly with some of the other crew members which is great uh i just don't know if anyone and i can't remember because i'm speaking all of memory here from uh almost 10 years ago but i don't i don't really remember if anyone took it quite seriously well i mean i think that is what creeps in with this pernicious doctrine of once saved always saved it's mm -hmm. easy to turn a blind eye to immorality and sexual immorality um, in particular, probably, um, if, if you think that just by confessing the name of Jesus Christ, you're somehow, you know, shielded from your sins and you're going to be judged based on not your own impurity, but on his purity and that his righteousness will somehow be imputed to you no matter what you do in this life. I feel like mm -hmm. That's just, it's part and parcel of that ideology. There's going to be a lack of a sense of urgency. Is that what you felt? Yeah, probably. I think that I think that's somewhat accurate. Um, and looking back on that, that seems to be true now. It's just something that I don't know if it was this weird public and private thing that just, Justin and I would have long talks about, you know, different topics, whether they be political or religious. And I found myself, you know, looking back on my Catholic upbringing and saying, okay, yeah, he would, ha he would probably agree with, a, you know, with a lot of things in the catechism of the Catholic Church. And then the public facing Justin would kind of go back on that. So I, I, I would assume there's probably a lot of pressure on him from the people around him to portray this sort of public personality while deep down he probably holds feelings that are pretty similar to mine now and not necessarily back then. But back then we, we would talk about all sorts of things. We would talk about the death penalty, we'd talk about abortion. Um, and now I think, you know, his views on those things, while he's still, I think, um, heavily involved with his church, seem to be inconsistent. Where is he at on those things right now? I haven't followed uh, I don't, the public presence. I, I don't want to necessarily um, speak publicly. I just remember that recently, and this is very recently, he had come out some, in some way with a pro-abortion, with a pro-choice pro sort of point of view. And I remember I DM'd him and I said, hey, man, this is, this is not it. And uh, he, he kind of told me uh, in a little bit of a swift reply, I'm not going to get into this with you over DM. So hopefully, hopefully if I see him again in person one day, I can talk to him about this and have a somewhat of a serious discussion. But, um, you know, he's, he has a lot of these sort of secular, s somewhat lukewarm, tepid, like you said before, Christian positions, progressive Christian positions. And I don't know if that comes from his church or if it just comes from the people around him. I also, I also, I also feel bad kind of, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not insulting him in any way, but I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm fearful for him, if that makes any sense. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah. that's I'm a concerned. true form of love is to, to yeah. be concerned for the state of somebody's soul. And mm -hmm. let me ask this, because obviously you were in this industry uh, for a good amount of time. So you're probably deep, deeply familiar with some of the decision making process that was there. But it seems like if you are very outspoken and uh, a very staunch Christian who's uncompromising when it comes to culture war issues, that you mm -hmm. might not get the opportunities of somebody like Justin Bieber. That if he were more outspoken, you know, he would have been withdrawn. He wouldn't have been as heavily marketed um, by the music industry, which is famous yeah. for really yeah. taking people and making them into somebody. If the music industry pushes you, then you obviously will get famous. Uh, there's a million people with a high level of talent and drive to to create music but only a certain handful are chosen to be pushed by the industry and kind of uh, commodified if that makes sense yeah well take Katy Perry for ex for example and she's a perfect uh, example because she started out 
when she wanted to act actively pursue uh, being a musician, especially a well-known one, she started out in the Christian world. I don't know if it was Christian pop or I don't know if it was... Uh, what do they call that sort of music that all the Protestants listen to? Worship music? Yeah, um, I think it, that's right. She, you're right, right. She wanted to be a Christian, a, a Christian rock star, and it just didn't happen. So she did a 180, and what was the first song that she came out with that was popular? I Kissed a Girl. So the secular world embraced that. Now, with Justin, he started out busking on the street, you know, doing covers of pop songs, and then became a pop artist himself. And you can even say the same thing about Kanye West, where they both started in the secular world. Whereas Kanye now can put out Christian music and it's well received by Christians and not necessarily well received by the secular world, but he's just that famous where he can do whatever he wants. And it's the same thing with Justin, where he is, he's put out, I don't want to say he's put out worship music, but I think he's put out a couple of songs that have had more of a religious or spiritual angle to them that he's now can perform in front of thousands and thousands of people and he won't be let's say, uh, I, I don't want to use crucified, but either lambasted or another, another word that describes being sort of um, pushed out to the, the borders of the music industry. Justin can kind of do whatever he wants now. Um, but as far as people who want to get into the music industry, you're 100% you're right. They can't start out uh, wanting to be Christian artists or Catholic artists. It just doesn't happen. They, they have to pursue a, a really independent route and try to be successful there first. And if they tend to cross over, then they can do that. But it normally doesn't happen. So when you were with Justin, I mean, his it seems like and this is to me as an outsider, um, but it seems like there's been some evolution, some trajectory into more of the Christian religion for him. Whereas it mm -hmm. seems like to, to my untrained eye that he started out more as a secular guy and has become a little bit more outspoken about his faith. Is that mm -hmm. am I correct in that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's gone through trials and tribulations it's like any young person does. But I think they, his trials have been a little bit more exacerbated by his amount of fame. Um, so I think he at one point he really tried to, uh, quote unquote, sober up and really get serious about his faith. And, you know, he brought in people who were able to help him with that. So I think that allowed him to uh, or at least enabled him to be a little bit more outspoken. So where were you at? in in your faith life uh in your faith journey when you were in this four-year stint with justin bieber where obviously there's been an evolution in you and that's the heart of this mm -hmm. episode of mic'd up where were you at um were you kind of at a fixed place was there some moment where the light bulb clicked on and you really um you know got fervent about practicing the catholic faith or were you nope. was this still a time of a greater tepidity for you uh, yep tepidity i love that word tepid as well um yeah i, I would i it's so cringe kind of to say it now but i would i would have definitely considered myself agnostic at the time i was more heavily politically conservative at the time so what i was known for was being that conservative guy on the tour and there were a couple of other uh you know, kind of crew members that probably felt the same way, but didn't really uh, speak up about it. I felt like I could speak up about it because I was closer to Justin and I was closer to, let's say, the public facing side of, of that tour. Um, so, yeah, just more politically conservative, you know, I'm that economic conservative and that foreign policy conservative. So I really wasn't touching upon things that that really dealt with religion or spirituality at all and it continued for for a while like this this reversion that we're going to talk about didn't really happen up until like let's say the, like the last six or seven months so throughout that whole time it was just pure agnosticism right were you comfortable in that agnosticism were you comfortable in that kind of lifestyle or was there something kind of gnawing at you in the back of your mind you know uh this bug of guilt the holy spirit kind of creating the uneasy conscience to perhaps uh nope. draw you back in in retrospect nope never never didn't happen i i can think about it now and i could see myself not not ever thinking about it that's interesting. Uh, was there anything you saw? I, obviously, in these years, and you mentioned you've, you've seen certain acts that 
kind of uh, pricked your conscience, perhaps, or at least sure, uh, sure. triggered you in a way to, to recognize, oh, this, this isn't right. You know, I'm, I might not be practicing the faith right now. I might be in an agnostic place as far as my beliefs go, but I'm seeing this and it doesn't sit well with me. Um, or, or were you fairly comfortable with a lot was, of what you saw? I'm going to tell you, on? I was fairly comfortable, but there were things that especially in being in certain parts of the world, like let's say levels of poverty that you don't see here on an everyday basis, that sort of stuff did, did trigger some, some, I don't want to say remorse or anything like that. I don't want to say any guilt, but I would see, and that you have to remember, Justin is incredibly kind with his fans. So there would be one of these situations where like a make a wish kid was at, um, uh, pretty much every show that he did like a little a little bit of a longer meet and greet with these kids. So when I saw, let's say, parents reacting to, let's say, either their dying child or their child with a horrible disability, meeting Justin and seeing like that kindness that was displayed from Justin, just seeing the parents react, like reacting to that, I felt something. It, 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 it could have just been, you know, uh, pure happiness out of seeing other people incredibly happy, or that could have been the Holy Spirit saying, look what's happening here. Look, 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 look what's going on here. Look at the kindness being displayed by the person that you work for. And then, you know, look at these children who, who really don't have anything, who are suffering and an incredible amount, have a couple moments of joy. That wasn't necessarily pushing me back to my faith, but it was, you know, revealing God sort of from a day-to-day -day basis. But the fact that I didn't receive that as I should have, that um, I have a lot of regret now like after seeing those things i should have gone to a chapel i should have prayed a rosary i should have even prayed i never prayed back then it, it, it's something that like if you had to ask me like do you regret anything yeah it was probably that time in my life sure and it does seem like a, a gentle nudge because you're you're looking at somebody like make a wish um kids or their parents and it it shows that there's this human desire to be loved, to be greatly loved, to be appreciated, to be treated um, as if you know you're special because obviously you are. You're a child of God, and this this really does confirm that Saint Augustine quote that our hearts are restless until they re rest in Thee, the, until they rest in God, and mm -hmm. um, you know perhaps seeing. Uh, this great aptitude to love on on the part of humans and the great desire to be loved is pushing at least readying you to to go to god who is of course the font the apex of love itself um okay so what happened next can you take me like the next step in your faith journey sure sure so after working with justin i i moved uh, back to New York. I was living in Philadelphia at the time. I moved back to New York. Then I moved out to LA. And in LA, I was working with this, uh, this kind of up and coming boy band. The name of them were, they were called Why Don't We? And they were having some, they, they were kind of like this band that was kind of put together by Hollywood management. That's a couple of them were on like America's Got Talent or uh, American Idol or whatever. That band, I toured with them for a little bit. I did a lot of their uh, photo photography and video content. And then I got hurt in 2017 and I moved back to uh, New York. And I started doing the photography thing again there. And I, I was working for Ralph Lauren at the time while still freelancing, the whole time freelancing. And uh, I met my wife and we were dating, got engaged, got married, uh, moved to Nashville still freelancing, still working for Ralph Lauren. And then I started the I'm Doing Great podcast at the end of 2021, December of 2021, and was doing the podcast for a while. And that's that's how we met. And it wasn't till uh, I, 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 maybe mid 2022 that I don't know what happened. This is going to sound very weird, but it was the it was the it was a it was it was a, it was a, it was a couple of things that all came together at the same time. It was a lot of Catholic memes that I was seeing on Instagram. It was Shia LaBeouf and Bishop Barron's interview uh, after he had converted her while he was going through his conversion. And it was just, I don't know, it, it was something that was, that was pushing me. And it all just sort of culminated into this one thing where I said to my wife, I got to go to church. 
I have to go to church again. I don't know what it was. I have to, I have to start saying the rosary. And I think it was probably just the level of extremist Catholic memes that I was seeing on Instagram that probably, you know, pushed me over the edge. That is an unusual way <laughs> to start pondering these things. I never, you know, obviously as a purveyor of memes myself, I never mm -hmm. thought that uh, perhaps this is a form, some subtle form of evangelization. It but worked. perhaps for our generation, this kind of humor and the mockery, you know, Saul Alinsky writes in Rules for Radicals about how mockery is really hard to defend against, impossible to defend against. And in certain senses, because we live in such a weird post-truth era, the fact that we can kind of make light of certain bad ideas through memes, uh, I think that might. I mean, there might be something to that. Uh, you might not be the only representative or uh, experiencer of that phenomenon. It, it actually. You know, there might be some more substance to it than than it sounds like. Uh, yeah, it, it it made sense because our show had to deal a lot with politics and culture at the time, and it was it was very heavily focused around you know conservative politics and conservative culture. And I remember we at at the time we had had on a couple of uh, Protestant representatives. We had uh, uh, what was his name, uh, Doctor. Uh, you were with him on the panel that we did. Uh, we did a religious panel. Do you remember his name? It's escaping me right now, uh, sadly. Yeah. yeah any, anyway, we we had a, a pastor on who was the president of a Bible of a Bible college. We've had a couple of other pastors on, and I don't know what it was. There was something that was lacking from them, where I said, I I I don't get it. I don't get Protestantism. And then it's just like the influx of all these memes. People in the comments of these videos saying, Mike, you have to look into Catholicism. And there were even some. Um, Orthodox apologists who were saying, Mike, no, Orthodox is the way. And at, for, for a second, I was kind of going that way, but I don't know if it was my upbringing. I don't know if, there, if I still had this part of me that is just so drawn to Catholicism, but I eventually came back to Catholicism and, uh, you know, being converted by comments, memes, and, you know, YouTube content or reverted rather is, pro is probably what did it. And during the show, a lot of people just came on. It was a lot of young conservatives and they would just, you know, pour out their adoration for Donald Trump. And the more I kept on hearing it, I just kept, I got over it at one point. I say, why are we idolizing this guy? This guy is no representative of Christianity. He's no representative, representative of Catholicism. And I kind of got away from the American political culture war. I think there, there still definitely is a culture war. But after that point, I started getting deep into uh, Catholic history, especially within the United States, you know, is something that I, that I learned very recently is Catholics were barred from voting in the United States until 1870 with the advent of the 14th Amendment. And a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people don't think about that, where um, that has really started to affect what I'm researching and what I'm talking about on the new show. Sure. You know, I think there is something there. Um, it, it seems like facing the overwhelming behemoth of kind of preternatural evil in the culture wars today, I think there's a point where a lot of people are struck by just the inability of straight secular politics, even if they're um, conservative and rooted in some very strong intellectual foundation and grounding, it, mm -hmm. it, they're just insufficient to deal with the problems that we're seeing now. They, what we're seeing, I think, are, are spiritual problems plaguing the culture for which there is no natural materialistic explanation and it has to be fought uh, through religion, through Christ, because we're talking yes. about something that's evil. Um, and I think a lot of people are waking up to that. It, would you say that was your experience? Is that something that you yes. that we were feeling? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, talking, talking about it uh, as much as I do, and just even trying to find the time to read as much as I can, I don't think that, I hope this isn't uh, controversial in, in any way, but I think the only true conservative is a Catholic. There's no two ways about it. You cannot be a conservative and be a Protestant. I think as a Protestant, you see yourself as your own God or as your own Pope, and you can interpret everything subjectively. And that's just not how it is in the Catholic Church and in the Catholic faith. So I'm trying to tell people, you know, if you want to be a real conservative, you must be a Catholic. And it's not going over very well through a lot of people. Uh, I find myself uh, trying to defend the faith as much as I can. And, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not like you. I'm not as learned or not as studied. So I'm trying to get there. Um, 
so so right now I'm trying to find the best way that I can relay that me- message in a positive sort of sense. Oh, I think you do a great, great job with your podcast. Um, and I Thank think you. you touch a lot of people. So I would not downplay that in in any way. But I think I'm 100 percent in agreement with you that, you know, Protestants are really the first liberals. The Catholic Church built Western society. It built all of our, the Western institutions that we take for granted. And the revolt against that, you know, that was that set the stage for many other pernicious ideologies. It, it really set a precedent for falling away from Western civilization, which is truly what liberalism really is, I think, in its rawest form. Oh, yeah. Um, the, the end of the end of Protestantism is liberalism. It is sort of, uh, in, you know, being enlightened and not in a good way. I mean, I people say, well, you know, the Catholic Church isn't perfect. It has plenty of its flaws. And I say, no, the Catholic Church is perfect as it was founded by Christ. It's it's the Catholics who need to do work because as people, you know, none of us are perfect and it is a fallen world. But the Catholic Church itself, I, I, I don't know if it's heretical to say the, the Catholic Church is perfection, I think. No, I don't. I don't think that is heretical at all. That's very much in okay. line with Scripture. You know, we yeah. have the Church, which is the unblemished Bride of Christ, uh, mm-hmm. that at the last day is going to be raised up in incredible glory, and her glory will be made manifest. Uh, something you said earlier interests me. Um, actually, a couple things. Number sure. one, you said you were doing work for Ralph Lauren. Um, and a lot of their, mm-hmm. if you, you know, if you look in like a Vogue magazine or something like that, a lot of their photo shoots aren't exactly uh, modest. They're not conducive to chastity. Um, at that point when you were doing that and you were more, well, I mean, you were closer to your your point of conversion um, than obviously you were when you're on tour uh, with Justin Bieber and whatnot. Was that triggering your conscience at all? Uh, the the fact that perhaps that there are photo shoots that fall short of a Christian standard by a long way. No, and only because I was working for them more on the retail side. So I wasn't doing anything for them creatively. Uh, so I was working in uh, one of their brands called Double RL, which is a higher end brand in the Ralph Lauren umbrella. It, it, it was, I, I enjoyed working there because it did give me, um, it gave me the ability to spread my, uh, my historical wings as far as researching and stuff like that, because we did sell a lot of uh, vintage items. That has really nothing to do with the company itself because the company itself, Ralph Lauren is a huge Fortune 500 company. So they did have some policies that I didn't morally agree with, whether it was selling or celebrating certain quote unquote holidays or certain um, active groups that I felt, you know, a corporation should not be celebrating and uh, its COVID policies and its policies surrounding you know, activism around Black Lives Matter and DEI just didn't seem right with me. But as far as the image they they put out, I I didn't find myself really um, in opposition to that because I wasn't directly contributing to that and I wasn't necessarily like the face of the brand. Um, So no, I really really didn't think about it that way while working for them. Sure, just typical. Had I been a photographer on the shoot, maybe. But at this point, again, uh, I had quit working for them in 2021, and I started the show two months later. So I wasn't even into my reversion or really at the start of that journey quite yet. Sure. No, I see. Um, it, it was secular politics then that helped kind of jumpstart you in your Catholicism? Was it, it, it? Am I getting that right? Was it just a lot of these secular memes that were taking you into Catholicism or were these explicitly Catholic memes? Uh, no, Catholic these were Catholic lines. memes. These were like hardcore Catholic memes. Like, give me some um, examples. Do you, do you remember any off the top of your well, head? So there's, there's, a, there's a feed uh, called, and a profile called Trad West that I started to see. And I mean, he's just great the way he kind of does imagery and music. But uh, it was it was saying, you know, there would be the typical meme of, you know, the average American, average American is enslaved by, you know, porn, debt, junk food, uh, immorality. And then all of a sudden it would be like your only true savior from that is Christ. And it would just kind of blast these images in front of you, almost like kind of like an eyes wide shut. I can't close my eyes uh, experience. Sorry, Clockwork Orange. But um, it was that and it was just other 
other accounts that would just share these kind of, uh, I mean, for lack of a better word, like based memes, just super based and, you know, exploring the ideas of Catholic monarchs and uh, like people like Fulton Sheen and other uh, other people in that sort of vein and the different saints and what they believe. You know, when I first saw that quote from St. King Louis the Ninth, the only way to speak to a blasphemer is to drive your soul your sword as far through his bowels as possible like that resonated with me because you know growing up and uh being a fan of 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 military history and guns in general i also i, I feel like a certain pull towards violence and hearing a, a saint kind of i don't know if he was being met, uh, metaphorical if he was being uh literal uh that kind of thing kind of piques my interest so i thought that was, that was really interesting and well, just kind of things like that Sure. The, I mean, the church stands as a sign of contradiction, the greatest sign of contradiction to the world, especially the modern world. You know, Christ mm -hmm. has come to the world and overcome it, he tells us. And if you read like, you know, John, John 1, it talks about that the light shone in the darkness and the darkness didn't overcome it. And of course, the church is infused with that divine light of Christ. So it stands in stark contradiction to the things of the world. And I think, um, I mean, you talk about it in terms of, of violence or perhaps righteous anger. And we mm -hmm. are a world that's saturated with a disordered pacifism um, that's very much humanitarian and laterally looking as opposed to vertically looking at God. Yeah. Um, and I think people... People are tired of that sort of thing. So just whenever the church is being countercultural, of course, it's a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the main issues that brought you, like substantive intellectual issues that you had to grapple with? I think you hinted at perhaps the papacy um, earlier. What are the main things that brought you intellectually back into conformity with the Catholic Church? Well, there, there was a lot of things. I mean one of the things that i had to really grapple with was the idea of the creation of the world and the universe and i was always this guy that saw the big bang as as a hoax because i would say to myself you know if time is infinite in both directions both pa both past and into the future how can we boil it down to a starting point i would start to think about these things from a physics sort of point of view saying you know matter ma uh, whatever rule of thermodynamics that you know, matter cannot be created or destroyed, that it always just had to be here. We always, whether it's some sort of, um, what do you call it, uh, oscillating universe theory, where uh, with the death of one universe comes the beginning of another one, and it just happens forever and in infinite. That was something that I had to get over, and I had to say, no, no, if there is a God and one does exist, then he is the creator of this universe. And I know now that it was a, I don't know if it was a Jesuit priest or just a Catholic priest who is the godfather of the Big Bang Theory. I can't remember his name right now. That's right. Uh, it was a Catholic priest and, you know, he was largely uh, looked askance at uh, mm -hmm. for positing that. But yeah, I mean, something like the Big Bang is basically creation ex nihilo, that doctrine, uh, yeah. through the lens of science. And this is another thing. This is, I've been on this kick lately, but the with a lot of Protestant reverts coming to the Catholic Church, you know, we've gotten an anti-science kick and it's like, there, no, 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 there's nothing yeah. to be afraid of. You know, the, the, the Big Bang, something like that, really, it's impossible to be an atheist if you yeah. accept that, because you talk about right. things not having a static universe, but a universe with a beginning. Right, right. And there's, there's a famous quote that is attributed to Einstein that my dad would always say is that God doesn't play dice with the universe, I think. So even Einstein uh, had uh, some sort of influence. I don't know if he was necessarily a Christian or just to call him a deist or whatever, but Einstein is certainly not an atheist. And so that was one of the first intellectual hurdles that, that, that uh, I had to overcome. And regarding the papacy, I remember even talking to you for a little bit and just sort of, that's why Orthodox Orthodoxy was, uh, or Eastern Orthodoxy was a little bit appealing to me at first because, you know, when you come from this sort of libertarian point of view and then you're kind of leaning conservative and you're saying, oh, you know, I, just as long as no one bothers me, I don't want to have to be subservient to anyone. I'm really not a fan of hierarchy. Yeah, Orthodoxy is cool. There's no central uh, authoritative figure. And for me as an adult, I'm saying, nah, it's really kind of like a childish way to look at things. Like we should want structure. We should want a hierarchy. We should seek authority from someone and who not, um, you know, or who better than uh, 
the papacy who better than the pope and that it stems all the way back to jesus christ and peter i think is something that shouldn't be overlooked i don't care you know how protestants want to put it it's 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 so stupid to say that you know the bible you know mentions nothing of a papacy or nothing of a first pope i mean it's 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 there plain plainly in scripture um so that was something that i overcame uh pretty quickly as as i talk to people like you and and other catholics uh online and in books as well and then i kind of feel like getting back into where i really got back into the faith was i, I said i'm going to start praying the rosary again so i picked up a rosary and i tell i think i told you this when we did our uh, panel but for whatever reason and i feel so strongly about this i felt i felt the hand of mary on my shoulder saying welcome back home son something along those lines where it was not clear but i just felt like that's what she was telling me and i think now my purpose is a is a very extreme and ardent defender of our mother of mary both in person and online i don't take kindly to anyone who defames her talks down about her i really don't appreciate that um and that's i think is maybe one of the things that was uh, instilled in me or maybe the purpose of my reversion is to you know bring glory to christ through mary absolutely and i think that is a commonality for many reverts to the catholic faith many people who might have been more lukewarm and start practicing their faith is that when you do start praying the rosary you feel a heavenly consolation for which there can be no natural explanation. I remember it starkly uh, mm -hmm. myself, um, praying one of my first like serious rosaries of my adult life and just the instant consolation from the affliction and the anxiety that had been plaguing me uh, for like weeks up until that point. And then just getting like two decades into a rosary and feeling like the mantle of Our Lady covering us so yeah absolutely mm -hmm. um, I mean it does the world a great service to turn her to a devotion to the Blessed Mother and like I said yeah or like you said um, you know anyone who speaks ill of the Blessed Virgin Mary that creates a very visceral reaction for Catholics who are close to her for those who have a devotion to her because they know the love of that mother and like right. you said with the with the Pope uh, it's so counter-natural that we see in other, you know, quote-unquote faith traditions, this disdain for the papacy, whether it's in orthodoxy or Protestantism, ultimately they're the same. It's a rebellion against the father. Like no mm -hmm. one speaks badly of my father. Every family needs a father and yeah. no one speaks badly of my mother. Every yeah. family needs a mother. You need that. And in, in Catholicism, you have both the father and the mother um, that are obviously here to guide you and to comfort you in different ways. Yeah, it, be, it, it was something that took me a little bit to get a little bit more comfortable about talking about it, especially with Francis that I've realized there's a lot of mainstream slander of Francis. It's almost like the mainstream media wants Catholics to dislike our Pope because of, let's say, some social issues that he might have an opinion about, or, you know, he's saying something about climate change that he may have an opinion about, which anybody can have an opinion about climate change. I might not even agree with the Blessed Father on positions of climate change, but he still is the Blessed Father. He still is our leader, our spiritual leader, and like, I, like our spiritual father that we have, uh, you know, a physical presence that we can relate to here on earth. And it took a couple of documentaries that I watched about him, especially recently. There was a great one on Hulu where Francis, uh, Pope Francis did speak to uh, a group of young people. And I was going to say, oh boy, he's probably going to, you know, going to have something to say about inclusivity or he's going to have something to say about abortion. And he was extremely Catholic and extremely doctrinal. Uh, everything expressed in the catechism he said about abortion he said about you know uh, girls selling themselves on only fans about divorce about homosexuality he was there he, he said everything absolutely correctly and i'm saying to myself how is the mainstream media trying to make us hate him it's not going to work on me um so that, that's one of the things that uh i i i 
I really try to focus on is saying, is trying to figure out how they're trying to sway Catholics away from their own faith. Absolutely. And you see the Holy Spirit really at work, even in this pontificate, which has had some genuine issues. And, you know, perhaps Pope Francis is more progressive on certain things, but this just shows the charism and the guidance of the Holy Spirit of the pontificate that a lot of what Pope Francis says is really salutary for the church. And mm -hmm. we do have this whole cottage industry that has been set up perhaps about criticizing him and, and making a name off criticizing him. And, and oftentimes that's really unfair criticism. Now, obviously when the Pope airs and when in his ordinary magisterium, he, he said a few troublesome things, um, then that's open to, to perhaps uh, filial and good faith rebuke uh, by the faithful. And Pope Francis has even invited that. He, he has instantiated a certain degree of humility and been like, yeah, when I'm wrong, you know, tell me, let me know. This is a good thing. I don't want to shut down my brother bishops who are right. telling me perhaps when I've said something that runs afoul of the deposit of faith. Uh, I do think there have been a lot of pot shots at him and it's been a bit of collusion between the far right Catholic media, um, mm -hmm. again, that has created a cottage industry uh, off of criticizing him, and then the far left media that's trying to draw a wedge between the Holy Father and um, just rank and file Catholics. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, we're up against the clock here, and I hate that because this has been, I think, uh, really insightful. A lot of what you've said, I think, is going to resonate with people who are perhaps on the fence about coming back into the Catholic faith. Um, and I think it's going to do a great deal of good. I want to ask you just before we go, you said mm. that what Shia LaBeouf and Bishop Barron talked about really spoke to your heart, really helped you um, discern properly towards the church. What was it about that interview that you found so compelling? Well, he, he talked about a bunch of things in that interview, and I think I remember one of the things that he talked about where he felt like he's, he'd gone to uh, a couple of other church services and he, he felt that he was being sold a car. And when he went to, I don't know if he went to a TLM or I don't know if he went to a Novus Ordu, Divine Liturgy, I don't remember what it was, but he felt that he wasn't being sold. He just felt that he was being comforted. And a lot of that was on the how I feel sort of thing. And a lot of people like to play that off. It's not about how you feel. It absolutely is about how I feel. It absolutely is. I'm not saying that, you know, the people who write worship songs in order to manipulate our feelings, that's, that's one thing. That's, that's different. That's all, that's all musicality. I don't really see anything with substance there. But if you go to a TLM, if you go to a divine liturgy, there is something about being in the presence in that church itself that I feel probably resonated with Shia that resonated with me. And Shia talked about, you know, his past and he's had a difficult and rough life, especially with family and with his own family and with his own struggles in Hollywood. And he just totally, I don't, I'm not using this word right, but like humiliated himself. How, how do you display humility? Like, how do you display kind of not, not, um, I see I'm rambling here and I hope your viewers don't mind the rambling as much as I'm, I'm having no, trouble with it. No, absolutely but, um, not. But uh, not guilt, but not regret. Like maybe he had been wasting his life not, not seeking this out. And that's kind of the way I felt. That's kind of why it resonated with me so much when I saw him talking about that himself. And I said, maybe I'm wasting my life here. And I, I had a discussion with my father recently who's, who, you know, like I said before, Jewish name only, but always came to church with us every Sunday while we were altar boys. And I said to him recently, I said, you know, why have you ever thought about baptism? You know, what, what is it? I don't want you to be on your deathbed and I don't want you to have that grace. And he said something to me, it was along the lines of, well, you know, structured religion, organized religion. I don't know if I'm, you know, a big fan of that yet. So I think hopefully with my reversion and I don't want to say my display of faith, but just me living as a good Catholic, that might change his mind a little bit. So I think my mission in life is to sort of convert my father, if that makes any sense. 
Absolutely. And I think a lot of people have felt that and where they discover the beauty and the truth of the Catholic faith. And they mm -hmm. want so much for their loved ones to have that because this truest act of love to um, care for somebody's final end, to care for them having the beatific vision uh, at the end of their earthly sojourn. And yeah. Um, yeah, I feel that is a commonality among many reverts. And it's honestly, it's difficult. It's, it's the hardest of all, I think, to convert your family, to evangelize your family. Yeah. But I know that God is going to work through you. Um, you know, he doesn't hide a lamp under a bushel basket. He is going to allow the light that, that's taken root in your heart to, to resonate, to shine out to the entire world. And perhaps, um, obviously your family, perhaps even to some of these to some of these stars, these pop culture icons that you yeah. have rubbed elbows with, uh, who might themselves be a giant beacon on a hill, if only uh, the light and truth of the Catholic faith can be implanted in their hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, that's all the time we have, unfortunately. Mike Lerner, thank you so much for being on with us today. Uh, great, profound uh, reversion story. And um, check out Mike Lerner's podcast, The New Nation. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you very much, David.